Why, hello, ladies and gentlemen. On today's show, Mackenzie Gore gets his first major league career win, and the Padres sweep the Reds. We get a home run from Hassan Kim, and we get another great start from Joe Musgrove and Jerks and Profar. Is he a superhero now? This is pretty nuts. A lot to talk about in today's episode. Locked on Padres. You know what it is. Cracking. You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for Wednesday, April 20th. As always, I am your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. If you guys want to find me on Twitter, you can find me there at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres. And if you want some of my baseball-related writing work, go check out Just Baseball, a great website. They drop their top 10 or top 100 prospects and on a future episode we're going to be breaking that down best believe it ladies and gentlemen and as always thank you for making lockdown padres your hashtag first listen every day we are free and available on all platforms although i must admit i must admit today maybe not your first listen but that was intentional it wasn't me being lazy it wasn't me being silly it's because ladies and gentlemen it was an early game today and i love early games i like it when i don't have to stay up until 1.40, watching the Padres. Even though I love it, I do like when I don't have to stay up late. Because today's afternoon game against the Cincinnati Reds, that is what we're going to be talking about today, as well as a start from Joe Musgrove yesterday as well. Going to be breaking that down because the Padres officially swept the Cincinnati Reds, got business done. And this was the most exciting game because it started with Mackenzie Gore for the Padres. Had a decent start against the Braves in his first major league outing. At least, a, a, I, I actually would just say straight up good outing based, based on the fact that it was against the Braves. And if not for Ozzy Albies taking him deep on the first pitch that he saw on his second at bat, right? We might have been a, even more impressed with it. But uh, lots to break down, guys, for sure. So let us begin. Let us begin, ladies and gentlemen. Let's start with Mr. McKenzie Gore, because that is probably why you guys are tuning into this podcast. Uh, game just ended probably by the time you are watching or listening to this about an hour ago. Uh, Mackenzie Gore in this game goes five shutout innings, only allowing four hits, walking two, and striking out seven. So over the course of his two starts, that is a 1.74 ERA, and he has a 1.06 whip because he's had two walks in both games. So what did I think? I thought for a 23-year-old, he was great. I thought he was pretty great. And I actually thought he looked better in this outing than his Braves outing. Granted, against a weaker lineup. That is true. There were a couple of times, especially with the four-seam fastball, that Gore had some guys swinging up at stuff outside, like top on, what is that called? Top of the zone? Top zone type of stuff that I was like, I don't even know if that was a great pitch. But, hey, it worked, and I'll still take it. Don't get me wrong. But for sure, I think the most encouraging thing about this start was we saw a little bit better of a pitch mix. And that was my one critique of Gore's start the first time. Now, it was a critique that came with a lot of um, adages to it. And the adages were, it was his first major league start. Maybe he's refining those other pitches, those other plus pitches, like his changeup, like his curveball, like his slider. Well, not like those are the other three pitches he has. Um, probably wanted to refine them a little bit more and slowly incorporate them and rely a little bit more on the fastball. That's totally cool, especially since his fastball velocity has ticked up over the course of spring training and what have you. And in this game, it was basically the same thing, 97.6 miles per hour on average. Um, his other pitches also had the same sort of velocity, no sort of dip. It wasn't just a one outing thing. That's great, right? Because Mackenzie Gore, not too long ago, I remember people were saying, oh, maybe it's a 95 mile per hour fastball. So that is cool that he seems to be getting better there. That's awesome. You love to see that from a youngster. And most importantly, um, as well, like I mentioned, better pitch mix this time. 57 fastball, so he's still mostly through the fastball, but slowly incorporating those other pitches. 14 sliders, 12 curveballs, and 5 changeups. I was a little bit surprised he didn't throw more changeups, but that's okay. Um, the slider and curveball at times looked outright mean 
outright mean. It looked like that thing started in New Jersey and ended up in San Diego. That's how much of a movement those pitches had. Across all the pitches that he threw, he had 11 whiffs, which was very good. He only had four last time, so it's a nice to see improvement there. I thought he looked really, really, really good. And don't get me wrong, he had some pitches that were so outside the zone where it just looks like the, it almost looked like the fastball slipped on him a little bit. It looked like it just went a little bit outside of the zone, didn't hit anybody or anything like that. But there were moments when he clearly seemed to lose a little bit of command. And that's okay, though. Again, this is a guy who's just starting off. And considering where we used to be, with Mackenzie Gore, where everyone was wondering, oh my God, this is another failed prospect from the Padres? That was a genuine kind of concern. And instead, it's been the exact opposite. He's regained that confidence. The leg kick issues and all that stuff seem to be behind him for now. And I like it. Now, don't get me wrong. He's still a four or five in the rotation. He's actually technically the four because he's taking place of Blake Snell. But I think if this is what they're going to get from Mackenzie Gore, obviously keep it coming. And I do like that he doesn't necessarily have to face the gauntlet, the murderer's row, the Avengers, the Justice League, the Straw Hat Pirates, whatever you want to call them, known as the Los Angeles Dodgers lineup. That lineup is crazy stacked in all sorts of ways. It's not like a Yankees lineup either. That's what's so frustrating. This isn't a Yankees lineup that's good um, for sure when they're on where it's just home run palooza. No, this is one that has Trey Turner and Betts. Then they have Freddie Freeman, and I don't have to recount all of that stuff for you guys. So thankfully, I'm really relieved that that wasn't his next start. I actually think that's a really good thing. And if I'm not mistaken, his next start is probably going to come against the Rays after this um, three-game set against the Dodgers. The Padres do end up going to face the Reds, and then they face Pittsburgh. So for sure, now is the time for the Padres to start winning. They've won four in a row, and I like it. I like what I'm seeing from the team. Now let's break down a little bit more from the rest of the game, shall we? Because the rest of the game did have some really cool uh, developments in it. First of all, it was Manny Machado's first day off from playing third. So he's still bat. Uh, he's still bad. He was able to draw two walks in this game with one of them being intentional um, and score a run. So, you know, they were just they were just fearful of the man. I mean, who can't be fearful of the man? Uh, Grisham batted leadoff again, kind of a whatever game from him. He does get an RBI double, though, which was nice. The first baseman who must not be named. All right. Thank you. I just y'all were on me. And by but when I say y'all, I mean, only some of you. I understand. Maybe it's a vocal minority. But some of you guys were like, you got to say his name. He's been great. He's batting 378. He's doing great. He's 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 lovely. He actually goes one for four in this game, by the way. Importantly, he grounds into two. Count him two double plays in this game. Thankfully, the Padres ended up scoring six runs, which is great. But, and, he, and by the way, his one hit was also a ground ball to the right side. So everyone who was on me a little bit, guys, I'm telling you, he did this last year. Last year, it was like a 310, 350 on base to start, and everything was on the ground. Everything. I tweeted a couple days ago, and I'm going to reference it again because it probably hasn't changed, but the Padres' first baseman, who must not be named, the ground ball gremlin, continuing to live up to that name, the lowest fly ball rate in all of baseball. All right? The only Don't get me wrong. That's not a be-all and end-all that you're bad, but considering you're a first baseman and you're hurting the ball as hard as he does, I haven't really seen much of a change. I just haven't not enough barrels and the launch angle is not there. So I'm just saying, guys, it was fun at the beginning, but expect uh, some regression for sure. And I think you saw that today with two double plays being grounded into. But that wasn't it. That wasn't it. I don't want to end it just talking about the Padres first baseman. Right. I want to talk about some other positives from the Padres lineup, guys. But before we do that, I need to talk to you guys about Blue Nile. All right. The original online jeweler to high income adults, primarily males, 25 plus looking to get engaged or just gift final jewelry. All right. Check out the website, guys. Um, what can I say? I'm not the biggest jewelry person in the world, but thanks to Blue Now, you can celebrate all of life's special moments from creating the custom engagement ring of their dreams to gifting a classic and timeless jewelry piece, all at prices you won't find at a traditional jeweler. There's wedding jewelry, there's fine jewelry, there's everything that you could really want. Again, I'm not a big jewelry person, but they just have you covered when it comes to this stuff. And they've got the best sort of prices that you need, all right? It's a statement piece, all right? You're going to be making a statement with the stuff that you get from these old guys and fellas and gals at Blue Nile. You know what I'm saying, guys? Hey, Mother's Day is coming up. 
Maybe you might want to look into that. I don't know. I don't know. It might be a little bit of the holiday season. It's the summer. Maybe that's what you want to do, guys. This Mother's Day, give them your mom. Uh, something they'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com. <sighs> what can I say, guys? Go there and use the code Locked On to get a discount off. It's really good. It's really good stuff, guys. Remember that is code Locked On over at Blue Nile, guys. Be sure to check that out. And now we have to keep moving. We have to keep moving. Because there was more that happened in this old Padres-Reds game, ladies and gentlemen. And the big headliner of this is Jake Cronenworth drawing three walks. Can you believe it? No, I'm kidding. Of course, that's not the headline, guys. The headline is Jerickson Profar. And, I mean, I haven't really talked about him much this year. The only thing that I've talked about with Jerickson Profar is that I do like him. Was he a disappointment last year for the Padres? Yes. If you just look at the basic slash line, 227, 329, 320 slugging percentage for Profar last year, which was the lowest of his career in terms of years that he actually played a lot of games. The lowest of his career was the, his 2017 season in Texas, but that was like a 207 slugging, and he played only 22 games. So that's what happens, right? He had the worst slugging percentage of his career. He only hit... Uh, seven home runs last year, if I'm looking at this correctly. I'm sorry, four home runs. Jeez, I forgot how bad Profar was in the power department. And he played a lot of games, and he just wasn't good. He was only valuable in the sense that he had some positional versatility, right? If you needed him to go around places, he could do that. He could play left field. And this year, so far in 2022, that's been basically the opposite. So far on the season, I mean, with today's game, he's now batting 256 and his on-base skills have been really good as well with a 378, now sure to be higher, uh, 378 on base percentage, just based on the app that I'm looking at right now. In this game, in this game, Jerkson Profar goes two for four with a home run, right? That's right, a home run and two RBIs in the game. Uh, he knocks in after the first baseman who must not be named, grounded into a double play after a promising start with first and second. Then... Manny Machado over at third, Profar drives him in with a home run, and he smashed the ball. He smashed the ball again later on with a single at towards the end of the game. And it just, he made really good contact. And also, he stole a base. So he kind of did everything. Oh, I'm sorry. He also had an outfield assist to prevent the only run that would have been um, on Mackenzie Gore's ledger uh, today after throwing him out from the outfield. A great throw from Profar to nail that sucker. At first base, that home plate. <laughs> Nail that sucker, right? Um, Just absolutely love to see it. Let me see. What what inning was that? Who did he throw out? I don't really have on my thing. Who did he throw out? Yeah, I believe it's who he threw out at home plate. Sorry about that, guys. But pro far to start the year has been very, very, very solid. And I think that this is reasons for the Padres this year was going to be left field, right? And they brought in Matt Beatty. They have Jerickson Profar, obviously. And in theory, Jorge Alfaro can play there. And I mean theory. And I don't even know if in theory it works because it's just just because you place a guy in left field, Marlins, doesn't mean that he counts as a left fielder now, right? So that is one thing that is worth paying attention to if you're a Padres fan is if Jerkson Profar can just be okay. Now, again, I don't expect him to be leading the Padres in home runs, which he currently is right now, which is just, again, that's nuts. I mean, he's already matched his total from last year, but if he can just be okay, and I've mentioned a lot how I like Profar, despite the bad season, he just has good vibes to him, right? He has good vibes to him. He looks like he's great in the locker room. He's got a perfect, beautiful smile, and I've always kind of liked Profar because I was a little mean to him in 2020 uh, at the beginning of the 2020 truncated season where I called him the most entertaining automatic out ever. That was really mean, and I quickly retracted that because he ended up having a good season too. And Profar was one of those guys that, giving his contract – uh, that AJ Prowler did heading into the 2021 season, it was very like, all right, like I don't hate Profar, right? Like it's this isn't a contract that's going to kill us, but it also felt very, you know, it doesn't seem like a guy you needed to lock up, if that makes sense. It felt like a guy like a a Josh Harrison, right? And I know Josh Harrison hasn't been doing well for the White Sox so far, but he has the positional versatility. He can give you okay defense and good batting average stuff, right? So for Josh Harrison, I was kind of like, that's the sort of player. That seems to be comp that I compare to Jerickson Profar. I didn't necessarily understand if you need to lock that up. But in terms of start of this season so far, he's been great. He's made good defensive plays before. He's hit big hits for the Padres and he's walking a decent amount. He's doing what I want Trent Grisham to do. There's so many guys. 
there are so many guys in the Padres lineup that are doing what I want Trent Grisham to give the team. Don't get me wrong. In today's game, I know he had an RBI double, but I just want more, man. I want a better walk rate. I want some more power. And we're just not getting that from Trent Grisham so far. So that's really unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. I hope that he can he can pick it up. And I hope that Profar, that this is, I'm not saying he's going to do this, but if you just look at his numbers from a couple years ago in 2020, kind of the slash line he gave, the 278, 348, that would be huge for this team, especially considering they weren't able to really draw on a left fielder. Really exciting development for the Padres. I don't know if he'll keep it up, but I will say the way he's lining the ball, the way he's hitting the ball hard, how he looks at the plate, it, it looks like maybe there's a little bit of a, a mechanical change perhaps that Profar made, and it does look like there's at least more credence to the hot start. This isn't just a lot of, a lot of lucky hits from Profar. Maybe it is. You could, you could say the fly ball stuff, maybe the fly ball ratio. I haven't looked at it. That might be in his favor a little bit. But bottom line, not as lucky as I think the first baseman was with a lot of his ground balls and the lack of fly balls. So that's very much something to pay attention to. And then lastly, in terms of this game, Ha Sung Kim deserves a shout out for hitting a home run in this one, a solo shot, but to center, which I very much enjoyed. Um, one thing that we should that I should mention is I was looking up on Baseball Savant because I did an episode on Ha Sung Kim rather recently talking about how he secretly could be an X factor for the Padres. You guys could go check out my article also at justbaseball.com. And I talked about him. When you look at baseball savant, not the best stuff when you see his batting. Hit rate is really down. His max exit velo, everything's in the blue, expected batting average. So it is true. Maybe he's getting a little bit lucky. Maybe. But I do like that he has a good walk percentage. I do like that he's not striking out too much. He's not chasing too much. Not whiffing too much, certainly, based on the stat cast stuff over here. He's a really fast runner. And most importantly, I'm expecting his defensive value to be awesome. I know right now it says his outs above average are in the 20th percentile, but that'll pick up. He was incredible defensively last year. I'm not really uh, all that worried about that. But just in the early going, decent on base percentage. I like that he hit a home run to straight away uh, center field. That is really nice. And most importantly, what I found very interesting is just looking at the stat cast stuff. His pull percentage from last year was 46.8%. This year, it's down to 33.3%. And his straight percentage is 44.4. Opposite field up from 15.4 last year to 22.2. So, Hope, again, it's a small sample size. After one, after like a three-game stretch of Hassan Kim, all this could change. And he could be pulling the ball. The expected stats could kick in. He could whiff more. All that stuff. I get it. But, again, that's hey, it's a daily podcast, guys. What do you want from me? In terms of what we're just seeing right now, this is why I was so much campaigning that Hassan Kim, I was cool if the Padres headed into the season as his as their basically everyday starting shortstop because of the defensive um, upside that he had and not much of a, a sample size last year. He was not much of a sample size, not much of a timeshare, I should say. Uh, last year, he was great. And I talked about this in the article as well. Maybe he could be up there with the defensive run save metrics and kind of go for a record or maybe get like 25 of them or something like that, right? So if he can do that, then he deserves a spot in the lineup or at least deserves a spot in some sort of platoon. And that's what they're doing now with C.J. Abrams. But if he's able to be this, this is one of the things I talked about, guys, then I'm totally fine with that, especially until Fernando Tatis Jr. gets back. And speaking of Abrams, by the way, I just mentioned, him. He has a hit in this game at RBI. It's nice. He's showing off the burners, turning off what he had. It wasn't really a double. It was just a single that he happened to leg out and turn into a double based on the Reds fielding situation. So that was great. I really like that both Abrams and Kim seem to be getting a mixture of opportunities. And I like that in theory, both of them are plus defenders. So at minimum, every day, you're getting really good infield defense, which is awesome. Awesome development for the Padres. But before we kind of close things out and give some final thoughts and talk about Joe Musgrove, guys, let me talk to you about something that isn't just good defensively. It's good all over the place. It's got variety, baby, man. This thing is the best, guys. They are the Built Bars. I've been talking to you guys about these damn things for literally two years now. So you should be able to recite word for word what I'm going to say. All right. You should know that the macros are great, 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and only 17 grams of protein compared to, all right, I'm, I'm testing you listeners. Do you know what I'm about to say? All right, 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. That's what you usually get from candy bars. So quite the upgrade in terms of the macros, and they've got great 
variety of flavors, guys. Cookies and cream, coconut almonds, coconut, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, cherry barcia, cherry. They've got everything, man. And I love that's what I love about them. So much variety and they taste super good. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, they taste fantastic. So what are you waiting for? Go to built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Remember that is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Oh yeah. yeah. All right. What do you, what do you guys say? Keep this. I think we should keep this moving. Let's talk really quickly. Uh, two final things I want to talk about actually uh, towards the end of this podcast. First of all, it is Joe Musgrove's start on Tuesday where he was excellent going six and a third innings. Uh, let's see here. Two earned runs allowed on four hits, a walk and seven strikeouts. The home run came from Mr. Tommy fan. By the way, we didn't even talk about him. Started off just a vengeance, a man of vengeance, Tommy Pham. All right, what is going on? He's hitting the ball hard. He hit the ball into like the second deck against Joe Musgrove to start off the game yesterday. And then, of course, Machado said, hmm, that's cute, and then hit a home run, a two-run home run. And then Tommy Pham hit another home run in game two in this game that we're going to be talking about with Joe Musgrove. And then Machado, the very next inning, said, hmm. That's cute. And then hit a two-run home run. So, shouts to Manny Machado protecting the soul of Padres fans who feel like they're being attacked by the evil man known as Tommy Pham, who also had some words for Luke Voigt, by the way, which I'm not going to necessarily bring up because they were a little bit a little bit nonsensical in my opinion. But basically, he viewed what Luke Voigt did in Tuesday night's game as a little bit dirty when he was sliding home plate and kind of dropped his hands down at the catcher, Tyler Stevenson, who had to be removed from the game. Hope that dude's okay. That was awful. I don't know if it was necessarily dirty, but I kind of understand why you might view it because maybe he saw the leg there and he was trying to like, you know, bring down his, his hands to maybe smack the ball out of the glove or something like that. Trying to jar it loose maybe, but he was in front of the plate. So it's not like it was a totally unprovoked collision. It's not like he ran in there with the elbow like they used to do back in the day before the institute rule basically. Right. But I get it. And then fam is like, that's dirty and going off. So He's really annoyed, and then he starts off to you know today's game with a single. So he just hates the Padres, and honestly, I'm all I'm all here for it. Kind of making Padres fans amped, honestly. At least it's making me amped. We need a villain. We need a non-Dodger villain. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause this is gonna sound free to cancel me in the comments, with the exception of maybe for me at least, Joe Kelly. There's not like a hateable Dodger. There might be for some off-field reasons, maybe Julio Urias. But otherwise, there hasn't been, like, a hateable Dodger. Like, I think Bellinger's funny with the meme stuff. But anyway, enough of that. I don't want to get down that rabbit hole. Uh, in this game, guys, we were talking about Joe Musgrove. He's excellent, again, only walking a batter. And, I mean, can I just end it there? There's not really much else to say. I think we need to start calling Joe Musgrove an ace. I, I really do. And I think that a lot of people have been doing this. But he just seems like a guy that, because his fastball isn't whizzing by you, that we tend to not immediately associate that with being an ace. But the bottom line is he makes it work, all right? In this game, generating 13 whiffs, eight whiffs on his slider. It was just untouchable. Um, didn't throw his curveball all that many times by comparison, but just the a great kind of mix of pitches. I think that's what makes him so, so dominant. And if I'm not mistaken, did his fastball velocity go up? It did, it did by just a, a, a smidge. But um, yes, because of the fam hit, the exit velo numbers were up. Yes, they hit him hard because of that. But for the most part, um, Joe Musgrove, great yet again. So far of this year, three straight quality starts. Six innings, two runs in his first. Six and two thirds, no runs in his second. Six and a third, two runs in his third. He's been great. Eight, six, seven strikeout rates. as Total strikeouts, I should say, uh, respectively. His first walk batter in this game. He's great. I know he talked about it before the game that he, or after the game, and there was some comments about, you know, he'd love to remain a Padre and whatnot. I imagine that given the fact that the Padres didn't spend too much this offseason, given the fact that they have a high payroll, that's part of it too. Part of it. That's part of it as well. But I think that they want to extend Joe Musgrove. He's the hometown kid. He threw the first no hitter. He's got a great attitude about him. Everyone seems to love him. The clubhouse seems to love him by all accounts. And he's just great. He's become like the ultimate Padre, basically, with the exception, obviously, of your Machado and your Tatis. He's kind of been the face of, you know, one of the best moves that A.J. Preller made was the trade for Joe Musgrove, right? As much as we give him flack, this has worked out brilliantly. And, I mean, I just don't see it changing at all. 
I feel like there's literally nothing to say about Joe Musgrove other than the fact that we need to start calling him an ace, at least in my opinion. Just my opinion, of course. You can hate my opinion. Totally fine. Plenty of you probably hate my opinion. I remember back in the day when some people were hating on the podcast because I had the Chargers folk on. And it was a really splendid little conversation, to be honest with you. We just kind of hung out and talked football a little bit. But I understand you guys don't want to talk about the Los Angeles Chargers. But nowadays, you know, feel free to hit me with whatever you want. And yeah, I think that we have to start referring to Musgrove as an ace. Now, guys, the last things I wanted to talk about, a little bit of a random topic, um, is the Apple TV broadcast. <laughs> and speaking of just people complaining and whatnot, uh, by the way, the Padres are 9-5, and five, uh, and they're heading into this series with the Dodgers. There will be no um, game tomorrow. It is their first day off uh, of the season, which is cool. And then they're facing the Dodgers, uh, hopefully, uh, they can get some wins out of that in Petco Park. The Dodgers are coming to town, and they've been looking really good as usual. But the thing I wanted to mention was Apple TV broadcast, just really quickly, because I've been enjoying this. I've been enjoying seeing seeing it. It's something different. They have these weird stats in the corner of each thing where it's like hit probability, and it's like a 50% when I'm seeing you know Brandon Nemo, and I'm like, don't get me wrong, Brandon Nebo, solid hitter for the New York Mets, but what the heck is a 52% hit rate? That's crazy. Like, you're saying he bats 500? Like, that's just crazy to me. So I don't always know what those little stats at the on the bottom right corner of the broadcast are, but I will say, Apple TV broadcast, the, the graphic is clean, the cameras are clean, really high-quality stuff, so there's clearly an investment there, and I kind of like that, and I like the energy of having some little stats in the bottom right. But I do want to voice my opinion on the announcers, the color commentary which has gotten a little bit of flack. And that's unfortunate because they have a lot of people that I really like, including Hunter Pence, Hannah Kaiser, and Katie Nolan. Hannah Kaiser, by the way, who has been on the Lockdown Padres podcast before. She was actually on, if I'm not mistaken, like she was supposed to be on the Friday that Joe Musgrove threw the no-hitter. Then we had to postpone to a Monday and he ended up throwing the no-hitter and then we record on Monday. So go check out that episode. It was a lot of fun. We did like a would you rather for baseball. That was a lot of fun. Um, I'm a fan of hers. I think she's a great, great writer, a great, great thinker in baseball over at Yahoo Sports. So go check that out. And then Katie Nolan, I think is really funny. And then Hunter Pence, super energetic. One of my five favorite baseball players of all time. And I know that that's Giants loving, but whatever you guys, sorry. I, I like the guy. Like I think he's, he was really fun for the sport. It is one thing that I will say is a lot of people were hating on Katie Nolan for not knowing everything about the Jackie Robinson stuff and making comments like, you know, if they tag your helmet, does that also count as tagging you or whatever? Here's my thing. I think that just as a default, baseball fans will literally always complain. All right? That's what I want my final thing of the podcast today to be. Baseball fans will quite literally always complain. This is the same sport that for a decade plus was arguing about, I don't want to see the DH because I really want to see the pitchers hit. The pitchers being guys that cumulatively probably have an OPS of 462 and bat 120. And th that's the fan base you're talking about. Very reluctant to change and always ready to complain about everything. This is a fan base that complain about the double header rule. I'm not even talking about the extra innings rule, which I like. I understand if you don't like. But it's more, here's the thing with the extra earnings rule. <laughs> I'm sorry, apologies for listeners who have heard me rant about this before. What do you want from me? Um, that I understand if you don't like it, but in the grand scheme of things, when it only affects like maybe 15 games max that are going to be in extra innings, out of the 100, 162 games that you get on the season, and that you're going to throw a fit because a few of them are going to be different, even if you don't love the rule, that's the type of fan base we're dealing with here. So I have zero shock that people are already ready to throw stones at the broadcast, at the commentary, and just hate on it. For me, it was fine. And I actually think a personality like Katie Nolan is really important for the sport. I, I really do. And if you don't like it, by the way, then just go, it's one game a week. You know what I mean? Like, it's... This, this level of complaint doesn't match ever what baseball fans do. They probably complained about, you know, uh, what, what, what the baseball fan? They probably complained about replay once upon a time. Remember that? Then we brought in replay. And don't get me wrong. 
you complain when it doesn't work. But people were complaining it's going to slow down the game. I swear I haven't heard a single person complain about replay since the two months after it came out. That first, Those first two months I heard it, after that, quiet. You mother effers complain about everything. So I say that all, all to say is maybe you listeners trust my judgment. I really think that a lot of the people they have on there, the play-by-play people, Hunter Pence is super full of energy. And I think Katie Nolan's really funny. I think Hannah Kaiser's brilliant. Those are my favorites on there. I think it's fun and it's adding a little bit of a flavor. I will say my one critique of the podcast or the broadcast, it did feel like with the Katie Nolan and Hunter Pence and whatnot, that combination, it did feel almost like, is everybody in on the bit here that she's doing? Trying to like have fun and just be hang out with this type of stuff, not loudly hang out or being boisterous and obnoxious, but just be very casual about things. I'm not totally sure if Apple TV, they like chemistry tested everybody. And they just sort of brought in people that might work. You know what I'm saying? And I that I think what's brought credence to that theory of mine is that reportedly, I think I saw this from the New York Post, that they were courting both Mina Kimes and Bill Simmons, which are people that, you know, I'm, I'm a decent enough fan of Bill Simmons. He has his issues. And I love Mina Kimes. That's interesting. But it looks like almost you're just aiming for exciting people. Not the worst strategy in the world, but it might suggest that you're just aiming for people. And we don't know how they're going to play off each other. Granted, it's only been two weeks of it, but that's my thing. I just want to give my thoughts on the Apple TV broadcast, guys. A little bit weird of a topic, I understand. But what do you want from me? Sometimes I, sometimes it's what I want to do is talk a little bit about the world of baseball. You know what I'm saying? That's that's what we do here. I have a playlist on the YouTube channel called The World of Baseball, where I talk about everything that is basically non-Padres related, other stuff in baseball and what have you, other, other storylines, because other storylines are fun. But anyway, hopefully you guys don't hate my take on that. I'm looking forward to the next Apple TV broadcast. Hopefully their chemistry and everything jives. And again, remember baseball fans, before you type those angry tweets, think about how often you guys complain about everything. As someone who is a fan of the NBA and the NFL, trust me. Trust me. You do not complain. You complain so much more than those fan bases about things that the sport does. Not like, oh, my team is bad. Everybody does that but the way the sport operates. There's always something with you people. Hopefully hopefully not everybody hates those comments and gets mad at me and whatnot. But anyway, guys, with that all being said, one thing I must say, you're going to be doing a crossover with Jeff Carr of Locked On Reds for tomorrow's podcast. That's going to be fun. Summing up the series, he's probably going to rant about how terrible the Reds are, maybe rant about Luke Voigt and whatnot, <laughs> but Tyler Stevenson. Going to be talking to him, maybe some trade targets that might happen for a team that is likely rebuilding as time goes on. That'll be a lot of fun. And then on Friday's podcast, I am planning to, as of now, do a lineup comparison of the Padres compared to the rest of the National League West, just breaking down everything, nerding out and giving my thoughts on that. And then maybe a crossover locked on Dodgers. I mean, we're due. It's the first one of the season. First rivalry match of the season. Might have to do that, guys. But with that all being said, that about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast. The only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow me on Twitter at Javi Peno. Hold on. Oh, there we go. At Javi Peno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. If you see me pointing on YouTube, and if you don't see me pointing on YouTube, go subscribe on YouTube, Locked On Padres, and at LO underscore Padres on Twitter. Until next time, stay safe, and of course, stay faithful. My fiery faithful homies, take care.